Hello, I am sitting down with Dr. Ross Upshur, one of the top 20 pioneers in family medicine research. Today, we get a chance to ask Dr. Upshur a few questions and uh, be enlightened by uh, his responses. <laughs> Hi, Dr. Upshur. Hi, Artem. Congratulations on being one of the pioneers. Thank you. Every so often, committees make uh, uh, unfathomable decisions, but in this case, I'm delighted to be uh, honored. Sometimes in research, you actually never know whether anybody's actually paying any attention, so it's nice to be recognized by one's peers. Absolutely. We'll find out by measuring hits on this particular YouTube video. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much for finding the time to sit no, down. appreciate it. Uh, yeah. We know that uh, Research Day is always a fun and exciting day for, uh, yes. for us, so we really appreciate you finding the time. So I guess the, the first question that I have for you, it's kind of a stage-setting one. Mm -hmm. As someone who has achieved quite a lot of success and very meaningful impact in your research, what about family medicine research do you find most rewarding? Well, I think the, the thing that's most rewarding about research is actually doing it and making a contribution. So the one thing you can say at the end of the day, once you've published a paper, whether anybody reads it or not, you've created or, or contributed an artifact of human knowledge that may or may not have any enduring value. But underneath all of that is the huge amount of effort that it takes to actually design, implement, fund, organize, create, analyze, and publish a paper. And all of the, what really makes it a challenge and makes it fun is that research in family medicine is relevant to a large population. So it does make a difference. But the other thing is that researchers don't research on their own anymore. It's a truly collaborative uh, enterprise. So the best part of that is you get to meet and work with incredibly bright people who help you understand the world a little bit better. And I guess if you think about it, the whole purpose of research is to illuminate aspects of experience relevant to health and try to find a way to nudge things to a little bit better understanding and hopefully improved outcomes. So it's a great, it's, I can't, I can't think of a better tonic for a career than research because whenever you get, uh, it's a way of kind of taking out your frustrations at the obtuseness of the world is to try to find a way to make the world just a little less obtuse and maybe a little bit more reasonable. So it's, it's a great thing to do. Excellent. Well, th thanks very much. I do think that the results of research is pretty much our only tool in the darkness of the unknown. Well, and, uh, yeah. And, 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 and I think right now, in terms of the evolution of family medicine as a discipline, it's essential that we be the creators of knowledge for family medicine because we're the ones who see the patients, we understand the patient's life world, we see what the problems are at the interface. And, and, and family medicine's a little bit more integrative than some of the medical subspecialties because we actually care about people within their family context, their work lives, their social environment. So that gives us a, a, a spectrum of possibility that other more narrow disciplines don't have. It also poses certain challenges in terms of the complexity of design, the clarity of results, but it really is exciting. And if we don't do it, somebody will do it for us. And the problem is that imposed research from uh, uh, people who don't understand the context of family medicine, what it means to be a family physician, is likely to be a less uptake and less applicability. And as we move forward, having a research base, at least in academic health science centers, is absolutely critical to your mission as survival for resources. If you're not seen as a research intense or a research oriented discipline, uh, many of the deans of faculties of medicines are going to say, well, what are you doing in an academic health science center? And we can move outside of that paradigm because we have, you know, all of the work, for example, that I think Neil Drummond or Frank Sullivan are doing to build primary care community-based research networks. If those existed when I was starting my career, I probably wouldn't have ended up in academia because I could have, in, you know, integrated research into my practice uh, back in the day when I was a rural family physician interested in research. Yeah. Certainly. Well, we all know that family medicine has a lot of faces in different settings and yes. certainly hope that uh, research can be brought to all of these environments. Yeah, absolutely. So you mentioned some of the, the complexities and intricacies of research you no doubt have a great understanding of now with your career. Mm -hmm. But thinking back towards the beginning of uh, when you were starting to do research, knowing what you know now, are there any things that you would have done differently? Um, yeah, I guess. So things you would do differently is I think you would have a little bit more patience. So one thing that you learn the more you do research is, the, is that it's a very non-linear process, though we're taught that it is a linear process. So when you go to school and they teach you how to write a protocol, you actually believe that the protocol is speaking truth to what's going to happen in the world. But of course, 
the only reason to be a researcher is to find the ways in which your perfectly written protocol is going to be thwarted by the <laughs> external world, and each project goes in a different <laughs> way, and it's remarkable. So learn patience, learn to expect the unexpected, because it's never, you know, you're always thought about what are the strengths and limitations of the approach, where's the pitfalls, where are the weaknesses. It's usually not the ones you think of that are going to thwart you. It'll be something somewhere else. You'll, st you'll stall on recruitment, uh, somebody who is going to be a key component uh, for whatever reason in the life world can't help you out. So you're, the, the, the one thing you would learn is to, one, to be patient, be very much more adaptable. I think I'm much more patient and more adaptable uh, than I was when I started. So the thing that I would do is just sort of, you know, plan for success, but uh, look out for all of the lurking minefields that were out to thwart you. And so the other thing I, I like to say is that Writing a research protocol in a grant is a form of creative nonfiction because nothing ever goes according to plan. And the really the, the 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 fine art of being a principal investigator is exactly learning that kind of adaptability. It's kind of like juggling on a surfboard uh, because there's multiple things going on simultaneously, and your job is to try to keep things moving forward to completion uh, because pretty much every force in the world is going to try to make that difficult for you. <laughs> Excellent answer. Thank you. And. Uh... Probably sometimes some of those uh, threats can actually be spun around as opportunities. Exactly. And so, um, you know, the, one of my favorite quotations uh, is, you know, Pasteur's chance favors the prepared mind. If you're actually looking for opportunity, if you, if you don't see threats, if you see them as opportunities, exactly, you can turn them around. The other thing that I learned early on is I think a lot of early researchers, they want to prove something. And I very quickly learned that the point of research isn't to prove things, it's to ask questions, the answer to which, no matter what data you get, is interesting. So positive, so I don't think in terms of positive or negative results, I think of meaningful results. And those can be negative or they can be positive. Uh, Public, publishing non-positive non, uh, results is sometimes difficult, and one of my favorite studies was with a grad student that was a null study, but it was an important null finding. And there happens to be a journal called the Journal of Negative Results in Biomedicine. So we submitted there, and soon after I was appointed to its uh, editorial board. Because the, it's, it's important to show what doesn't work and what doesn't happen, because that partitions off a pathway that people don't need to go down again. And one of the problems we have now with a huge plethora, I mean, I, I, I defy anybody to say that they can actually keep up with research in any but the most narrow field, and family medicine is far from it. Um, we need to find place, people need to look to see that things have been done before, because that's the other thing you learn in research, and I try to train my research students, is you have a good idea. Likely somebody else has had that before. Make sure you've looked under every rock to make sure that somebody hasn't done this, they've published it somewhere, it's in the gray literature, so that you're not wasting time looking for a result that may not be there, and by the way, don't do research to look for results, look for research, do research to answer interesting questions. Thank you, very good perspective. And you did a bit of a mind read here because uh, some, my next question was going to be um, perhaps for you to reflect on some of the results of your studies in the mm. past that have come out not the way that you have expected them, perhaps mm -hmm. surprising or disappointing. Mm -hmm. Would you be able to provide one uh, one? Yeah, so example? lots of studies prove surprising. And again, depending if you if you ask questions and you're just looking for interesting answers, then every time you look at the data, be it quantitative or qualitative, it's exciting, right? The most exciting thing is when you get your data in, and if you're not looking for something, you're bound not to be disappointed. So I think I developed this perspective largely as self-protective mechanism to keep going because you often think that the answer is over here, and a lot of people teach you that you know research is about you know, testing hypotheses and confirming or disconfirming those hypotheses, which is a little bit not quite the case. So if you're looking to confirm or disconfirm a hypothesis, that's one frame of thinking. If you're, again, if you're looking to answer interesting questions, you're never disappointed because you're always going to get data regardless. So when I turned away from that, I'm looking for an answer to this. And I'll give you a concrete example. So when I started uh, uh, after my residency in Sunnybrook, I was interested in anticoagulation, so the use of warfarin. And what we were doing in that practice was that we would have, we would write it into a book and the INRs and the patients would be called and the nurses ran it. And I thought there's got to be a better way. There's got to be like a tool, a computer or something that was in there. So we started actually by just a lot of grunt work. We went to all of, the, it was all kept in a book. 
This is in the day before Electron, <laughs> it's not that long ago. So we took all the results, we calculated the mean time in range, and actually what we found is that it worked. The, that our patients were in range equal to or better than anticoagulation clinics, and there was a large one in the hospital I was working in at the time. And then I thought, well, let's do a qualitative study. What did patients think of this? Patients loved it. Patients were happy. The nurses were the heroes. So starting out wanting to change something, I found out that we didn't need to change something. We actually needed, and there was actually talk of nurses are wasting too much time taking blood. Uh, they could be doing other things. Uh, we should move, you know, all the patients to the anticoagulation clinic because they're specialists in anticoagulation. Right. Uh, we found out, no, actually, we're doing a very good job. We don't have a very high complication rate. We're in range. Uh, nurses actually enjoy the work. Patients love it. And because most of our patients had atrial fibrillation, had a large po population of atrial fibrillation on warfarin, they always have something going on, and the nurse could tap into that and then alert the clinician if there was something wrong. So it was actually an intel. Uh, and so we found all, so we looked, we were looking here, we found out all of this, we kept the process the same, and then we had results. So when the head of the anticoagulation clinic, who happened to be my patient, came to me and said, you know, how many, how many patients you got? And he said, you know, I gave him the number and it was more than he had because he was trying to make the argument that we should be sending all of our patients to his specialist clinic. Right. And I gave him the numbers, gave him the data, and he said, no, keep them where they are because his clinic serviced younger people who had, you know, were taking warfarin for probably mostly for venous thrombosis. We had a large group with and, you know, atrial fibrillation, who are all multi-morbid seniors, and we were able to serve their needs better. We had the quantitative data, we had the qualitative data, and my grand plan to change things around, and make it modern, fell by the wayside. So that's, I think, a nice story of how using research, one confirmed the effectiveness and value of a practice that was threatened because there was a move to move it out, to give it over to another group of specialists, and actually people took it on and, and owned it as a success, that we were actually doing a really good job. And so it was, that was a really rewarding project. On the other side, I think almost all of my best ideas have never been funded. You know, <laughs> so, you know, all these great you, blood, sweat, and tears, you write a great protocol, you send it in, and it doesn't get funded. And then one that you kind of sort of care about does. So you got to be careful. Sometimes you get stuck doing projects that you're kind of keen on because you get funded for it. And the ones that you're really, really motivated to do, nobody can see the merits of. And uh, so it's, that's the thing about research is it's always a surprise. Excellent. And also a great, great example of how research really can meaningfully drive yeah, policy. Yeah, very local decisions. though. Very, very local. Um, now we could have meant to sort of take, so then the, you know, the problem there is, did we scale that up? Did we go to other practices? Did we repeat that and, and replicate it? And the answer to that was no, because nobody was interested in funding that particular line of research. So often your best ideas, and this is again, um, you know, advice for younger uh, clinicians or who are thinking of doing research is to have multiple irons in the fire because sometimes your best projects will get this far and then they'll stop. And that's the great frustration of a research team life is you will train up teams of researchers, research associates, coordinators, co-investigators, statisticians, methodologists, qualitative, quantitative researchers. You're doing great work and then your funding ends. And then what do you have to do? You have to do it all over again, build those relations. And I've been lucky and fortunate because a lot of my research colleagues and, and team members have shown tremendous loyalty to the cause. And so whenever I run out of money, they'll go find something. But as soon as I'm back funded, they all want to come back and work, which is great because forming a team and, and creating that research team is the key strategy for a successful research career. And I tell young researchers, build your team and do everything, move heaven and earth to keep them together. So, you know, I've paid out of my own pocket, out of my own AFP to keep my team together. And you have to do that because otherwise you have to retrain everybody and it's never quite the same. Excellent. Well, you already gave a couple of excellent uh, advice, ex advices to uh, some of the younger researchers. Mm -hmm. um, are there any other specific things that you'd yeah. be able to impart? So, so I think is, you know, develop uh, Teflon skin. So peer reviewers aren't speaking about your soul. 
Uh, and I, I remember being very early on, you know, when I got my first rejection notes on, on submitted manuscripts and grants turned down, it's hard to get started. You kind of feel like you've been personally slimed, that they're actually judging you as a person. But perseverance works. You have to take what they've told you because the people who are reviewing them, sometimes they're off and sometimes they're on, but take very seriously what any peer review says and then try to adjust and deal with it. So develop thick skin, develop perseverance, plan for failure because most science does fail, right? Not everything's a great home run that's going to end up on the front page of the Globe and Mail. In fact, perishingly little research does. It's usually a small component on the way to a greater, broader understanding. Build teams, nurture them, love them, take care of them, uh, celebrate your successes when you get them because it's hard won. Most people do not understand how hard it is to actually get a peer-reviewed paper in a decent journal. That is a very, 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 very long road. You often have to write 10, 15 drafts of the paper. You have to deal with intemperate peer reviewers. So do it because it's incredibly exciting, but really you've got to have a long game in mind and don't take anything personally. The quicker you can develop Teflon skin and turn it into a joke, so we used to have like, we'd always have these little meetings where we would, <laughs> you know, you first you vent about the peer reviewer, like, what kind of a fool? How can they not see the absolute brilliance of our paper, our protocol, blah, blah, blah. Then you get all the ventilation, say, okay, you know, they were kind of right on this point here. We did kind of miss this one, so let's go. So, you know, it's the old saw, if at first you don't succeed, try, try again. If you keep persevering, you will get funded. If I can get funded, anybody can get funded. If I can get published, anybody can get published. If you, if you persevere, you will, and then take on and mentor uh, as many people as you can. Build big teams. Go, go outside the box with methodologies and dream big, and it's fabulous. That's great. Thank you. I'm sure many of the young researchers <laughs> out there will appreciate that, yes. especially about the, the, the patience and the, the thick skin. Yeah. Um, so now that we're coming to an end of the interview, I would love to hear your impressions on a higher level, uh, we spoke a lot about research and some of it about specific uh, to family medicine, but what do you think makes family medicine research special and important for you personally? Well, I, I think it's that family physicians have a true insight into the entirety of the human experience in ways that other medical disciplines or, or even other uh, allied health professions don't have. So in the, in the room with the, with the uh, patient, you're told things that sometimes you're the only person that knows that. And so you, you see everything from cradle to grave because non-abandonment being with the patient through their life course is a key component. And that's what makes the research special because we have to work from a point of view that, yes, we're conscientious, caring physicians, but we cannot say that we have all the answers and that everything that we try works. That's just blatantly not the case. And there is very much uh, uh, huge challenges with demographic transitions, with aging populations, with chronic diseases that we can only figure out if we apply reason through structured thinking, call it research, call it quality improvement. But we always have to be thinking about how we can do our jobs better. And because we see people through the life course in their context of their family, in their community, we take their work life and their social determinants seriously, we have a huge opportunity to actually transform the way we think about health, healthcare, and improve service delivery. Fantastic. A very humanistic approach. And, <laughs> yeah. uh, well, I started I as a that, philosopher, right? Ah, you know? Well, there, there we go. There we go. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you very well, much thank you for, for, your uh, time. for stopping no, by to talk uh, to us. Thanks to the college for uh, actually uh, paying attention. As, Thanks uh, for all your work and congratulations yeah. on thank being you. a pioneer. Appreciate it. Yeah.